Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Matthew Blum, Associate Administrator in OMB's Office of Federal Procurement Policy. I'm pleased to be joined today by colleagues from OPM, GSA, and DOD, who will discuss two important resources that members of the acquisition workforce and others can leverage to make acquisitions more agile and responsive to the needs of our taxpayers, as called for in the America First budget. First, you're going to hear from James McPherson, one of OPM's Deputy Associate Directors, who will discuss the Human Capital and Training Solutions Program, also known as HCATS. The HCATS program sponsors two best-in-class government-wide contract vehicles that were created through a partnership between OPM and GSA to give agencies reliable and timely access to best value, customized solutions for human capital management and training requirements. These contracts are being showcased today because the services they offer may be helpful as agencies develop and implement plans to reshape their government activities and improve service delivery as called for by the President's reorganization executive order. Next, you will hear from Michelle Warren, a director in GSA's Federal Acquisition Service, who is actively working to support the government's efforts to be a smarter and better coordinated buyer of professional services. In addition to being an instrumental partner in HCATS, Michelle and her GSA colleagues will be working with OMB and agencies to think about how to build our expertise in the use of facilitated requirements development workshops. As acquisition professionals, you know that behind every successful acquisition is a sound requirements document. A number of years ago, DOD began requiring facilitated requirements development workshops, which they call service acquisition workshops, or SAWS, for their largest dollar complex services acquisitions. They took the step to ensure that the statements of work for these acquisitions effectively reflect the cross-functional input of program, technical, and procurement personnel. Our third speaker today, Larry Floyd, who is a learning director at the Defense Acquisition University, will explain how SAWs work and how they can be used by any agency to shorten acquisition timelines, reduce cost, and increase the likelihood of successful contract completion. When you complete this webinar, we hope that you will have a better understanding of the value of HCATs and SAWs, and also see how these two tools can be used together to help you, your agency get timely access to human capital resources for your agency's reform planning. We encourage you to reach out after the webinar if you have any questions and actively explore the use of these tools. And each of our presenters, James, Michelle, and Larry, will provide information on how you can contact them. So let's get started by hearing an overview of HCATS from James McPherson. James, thanks very much for being here and sharing your thoughts and insight today. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing your great insights on our purpose and plan for this webinar. In this section, I will provide an overview of how agencies can benefit from the collaboration between OPM and GSA. Late last year, these two agencies released a human capital and training solutions contract to small businesses and larger industry partners. HCATS is comprised of two indefinite delivery, indefinitely quantity, IDIQ, government-wide contract vehicles. For ease of communications today, I will refer to them as the HCATS contract, since the provisions of both are identical except for the size of the industry partners. The contract is uniquely positioned to help agencies fulfill the requirements of the OMB memo 17-22. The memo requires agencies to be effective and efficient in reviewing and revising their organizations and strategic and operational plans to meet mission-critical goals and objectives. While agencies must provide deliverables in the subject areas of strategy, operations, human capital, and information technology within their allocated budgets, our HCATS industry partners can work with them to customize their responses based on their unique needs. Since the OMB requirements are through fiscal year 2022, the HCATS contract allows agencies to have the same industry partner beyond that period to meet 
their performance expectations. Also, agencies are not required to have the entire budget for all of the reform and reorganizational work during the first year of the contract. The HCAS contract allow agencies to identify work to be performed in years beyond year one without providing funds in year one. In order to fund their work, agencies have the flexibility to use the cost structure that best meets their needs to minimize risk and to maximize performance. Based on the specificity of the work and funding requirements, the HCAT contract permits agencies to use a multiplicity of contract types, including firm fixed price, time and materials, labor hours, and cost reimbursement arrangements. To ensure that the agencies have the best and the brightest talent to help them provide high quality and timely deliverables to OMB, the HCAT's contract team has talent with deep and broad expertise. Agencies benefit from the human capital expertise from OPM, the acquisition expertise from GSA, and the full range of expertise in human capital and organizational improvement from pre-qualified industry partners with well-recognized brands. Those partners are listed on our website. As a result of the many contractual attributes I just described, the federal government's Category Management Leadership Council, as Matthew just said, designated HCATS as a best-in-class contract. If agencies decide to use contractors, the OMB memo strongly encourages those agencies to use best-in-class contracts to meet the reform and reorganization requirements. The next slide provides the specific work that industry partners can provide to meet OMB requirements. The two primary service areas that help agencies to meet those requirements are one, human capital strategy, and two, organizational performance improvement. The scope of work in these two service areas directly address what agencies must deliver to OMB this year and in subsequent years. Specifically, the HCAS industry partners have deep expertise in analyzing, revising, delivering, and adapting strategic and operational plans. As part of those plans, agencies will have access to those partners to help them develop and deliver the best ways to have quality people in the right quantity, in the right places, at the right time to ensure maximum performance today and in the future. The HCATS partners are also equipped to help agencies deliver on the strategy and human capital requirements through leveraging the effective and efficient processes and technology. While agencies recognize, or when agencies recognize, they have the need to reorganize or transform their organizations, industry partners possess that deep expertise as well. You and your agencies have access to these industry partners in two ways. If your agencies have the requisite expertise in human capital and contracting, you can choose the direct route by obtaining delegated procurement authority from GSA to run your own acquisition. Agencies pay a small fee to gain access to use the contract and to the industry partners. Agencies also gain the benefit of getting complimentary advisory services to help them with their performance requirements for the acquisition. Or if you want to take advantage of the deep expertise of OPM and GSA, you should use the fee-based acquisition route. Those fees cover expenses of OPM and GSA in providing the assisted acquisition services. The fee is based on the size and the complexity of the contract, averaging about 6% of the total contract value. To learn more about how we can help you and your agencies provide high quality and timely responses to OMB, please refer to the contact information at the bottom of page five. 
Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my GSA partner as Matthew has said, Michelle Warren of GSA Region 10. Thank you, James. Um, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're at. My name is Michelle Warren. I'm the Director of Acquisition Services Division out here in Region 10 in Auburn, Washington, the local Seattle area. And in this division, we have Assisted Acquisition Service, which serves as the acquisition office for OPM's HCATs. So what will happen is, um, as you can see, OPM will market um, the HCATs portfolio to you, the customer, and James gave us a great definition of all the wonderful things that are out there for you to have access to. Um, they'll direct the customer relationship, OPM will serve as your core, and they do perform project management on your behalf. Working through your requirement, once the purchase request package is complete to include funding documents, the package is then given to GSA if you're looking for the assisted acquisition services. That's where we get to come in and provide you some really talented resources okay. regarding the program management and also in our contracting officer skill set. We're here for you throughout the entire acquisition's entire life cycle. Uh, we'll work directly with both you, the customer, and the OPM project managers as we go through the pre-award solicitation and then eventually the award and, of course, uh, post-award administration. Um, the contracting officer uh, for GSA um, does provide the contract administration, so it becomes seamless and uh, really no, no uh, touch for you um, and your acquisition shop. We do all the heavy lift for you. Um, I've provided you the GSA points of contact. So we have a GSA program manager for HCATS. Her name is Joanne Lee. The director of AAS is Kim McFall. She works out here in Auburn as well. And our program manager in our assisted acquisition services is Buki Kahende. And she also is out here in Auburn. So once you've decided to um, use HCAT and work with OPM and you do want a assisted acquisition, that is where we out here in Region 10 for the professional services and human capital categories will step in and work on your behalf. And thank you for the time. Um, what I would offer is I have personally experienced the benefit of 26 years and um, getting all the stakeholders in one room at one time to talk through an effective acquisition strategy and a milestone plan and having your draft documents ready to go, it's invaluable. So I hope that you take a, um, a look at what Larry is going to be sharing with you as he w walks you through what a SAW can do. and then. Find that one requirement that would be a good candidate for you to have a saw with, and uh, let's go execute great things together. Larry? Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, good morning. We've just completed a discussion on how to use the Human Capital and Training Solutions contract to assist you in preparing your agency reform plans in accordance with OMB Director Memo M1722. Our next step is to demonstrate how civilian agency can, agencies can develop a contract requirement in an accelerated time frame with a trained facilitator professionally managed by an agency's multifunctional integrated team and develop a performance-based acquisition solicitation and associated contract performance metrics. At the conclusion of the session, executive branch agencies will have a roadmap on how you can replicate a DOD proven acquisition practice to solicit, award a contract or task order, and thereby ensure more efficient and effective contract performance. You were selected to be a part of this session because you want to make a difference in your agency's implementation of OMB Memo M1722 and help your agency perform at the highest possible level while providing citizens the best in-class services for their tax dollars. Imagine that you're new to your agency's human resources or acquisition office and you've been assigned to plan and define requirements for contracted assistance 
to develop an HR strategic plan. You've seen the agency's previous five-year strategic plan, but you're not sure all that was involved and which stakeholders assisted in the development. Your agency CFO and senior acquisition official agree to bring together funding and the need to get help for the HR strat plan. You say to yourself, where do I begin? I don't have the expertise and wasn't involved in the agency's prior strat plan. What kind of help do we need? How do I get help to write the requirements? So let's begin to help answer your questions. My name once again is Larry Floyd. I serve as a learning director of services acquisition at Defense Acquisition University. The purpose of my portion of the presentation is to demonstrate how civilian agencies can develop a contract requirement in an accelerated time frame with a trained facilitator and devo develop performance-based solicitation requirements. The agenda is as follows. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a service acquisition workshop is, what's the value of a workshop, and then I'm going to go into a what I'll call a semi-live demonstration of a couple of tools that we use to help us do the requirements definition, requirements formulation process, as well as develop evaluation factors for award. Finally, I'll summarize what we've learned. So what is a service acquisition workshop? Well, the operative here is that it's a workshop. It's a training event, but it also has what I would consider to be some highly uh, detailed consulting aspects to it, which would include taking a multifunctional team, bringing them together, sometimes for the very first time, because in DOD, I don't know about your other agencies, we have a widely disparate and virtual workforce. As such, we can have a contracting officer, a contract specialist, a requirements owner, and a quality assurance specialists in very different parts of the country and they've actually never been brought together nor do they have what would be considered an ongoing program management office type of function. And as such, we use a workshop approach to bring them together physically as best we can. Some have to dial in to make it a partially a virtual event and then we'll go facilitate them through the workshop approach. The workshop approach is based upon Department of Defense's seven-step service acquisition process. It's, once again, we didn't invent it ourselves, it's an adaptation of a long-ago seven-step process, uh, probably somewhere in the middle of my career about 20 years ago. Step zero is actually a step that we use to do the initial coordination and planning for the actual workshop event. What we'll do is we'll work with the requirements activity, requirements owner, mission owner, whatever you, whatever you may wish to call it, and we'll work with them to determine where they are in their acquisition process because we don't have any way of predicting or forecasting when these activities will be in a state of readiness to do these workshops. It's important to note that for DOD, we actually have established policy that mandates workshops for those service acquisitions that are valued at a total contract value of $1 billion or more. Additionally, the United States Army has levied a, a lower threshold for those acquisitions that are valued all the way down to the, between the value of $250 million and $1 billion. It's important to note that the actual workshop event is scalable in its duration. Uh, I personally have been involved with uh, in excess of 10 workshops in the six years that I've been doing this, um, and no one workshop works and looks and acts like any other one. They are very much a consulting event. Um, however, we do use, uh, to the maximum extent, a very uh, measurable, steady approach to 
conducting these workshops and we continuously get feedback from the workshop attendees so we can make improvements as we continue to build out and do more workshops. The, what I mean by scalable dura duration is uh, I've done workshops that were primarily focused on uh, a services uh, acquisition requirements area and done it in approximately two days of the actual touch time of a delivery of a workshop with uh, probably a one for one hour for hour preparation that goes into actual the uh, conduct of the event. So two days would be probably on the low side uh, and then on the high side over a two year period uh, I was involved with the uh, uh, Defense Health Agency's TRICARE recompete contract and uh, I was involved in, in uh, fairly regular and uh, protracted consulting engagements over that period for a, what was to be a two-year period. So uh, just a, from a statement of an estimate as far as what, what the total time involved with some of the workshops that we've been involved with, um, those acquisitions up to $250 million, we would expect to generally take about 58 hours, including prep time all the way through to delivery time to actually conduct the workshop. But that, that type of a workshop would, would necessarily probably include all of the seven steps. And I'll talk about how we can truncate them or we can scale the actual workshops uh, as we go through the presentation here. A workshop for perhaps just defining the requirements might take as, as little as 16 hours. However, um, the, the amount of time that it takes to do requirements is highly dependent upon uh, the multifunctional team ensuring that all of the uh, proper people that uh, are involved with the actual uh, expertise that the types of services that are being purchased uh, are involved with. That would include any of the folks that would be involved with assessing the contractor's performance and also include uh, the folks that would then take that assessment and, and put it into the contract performance assessment report uh, periodically during the actual performance of the contract itself. Uh, one thing to note is that the requirements definition, step four, um, we use the tools that I mentioned just a moment ago previously. Uh, the names of the tools are called the Acquisition Requirements Roadmap Tool Suite. It's a tool suite. There's actually four tools. Um, the Requirements Definition component is the one that we'll provide a demonstration on here in, in just a minute. There are other tools, uh, other tools to help you develop a source selection plan. That would be the E-EF or Evaluation Factors component. Additionally, we have a Cost Estimation component, or CE. Uh, and then finally, an art performance assessment tool. Uh, these uh, tools are, were actually developed in Microsoft Access, uh, which is a database part of the Microsoft Access suite. Uh, that was uh, primarily selected to be able to be a software application that wouldn't require further licensing on the part of any user. So these tools, being what they are, they're actually a uh, database uh, file that can be downloaded and I'll show you how to do that in a moment um, and then the tools themselves don't have to be licensed and there's no fee to use the tools themselves. The end product that we uh, expect and we uh, strive to achieve for each one of the workshops uh, is uh, the draft performance requirements documents, performance-based, and uh, Part 37 of the FAR uh, states that a, a preference for performance-based acquisitions, and the tools are designed to put together the requirements in such a fashion, in a roadmap type fashion, um, and I'll show you those during the demonstration, and then produce at the end a performance work statement and a quality assurance surveillance plan. Uh, additionally, invariably, teams uh, that may not be necessarily folks that have had experience in a uh, contract competitive source selection before, they may recognize that they have some competency gaps 
they have some needs in order to help the team be a more high performing team and we try to identify any additional training needs for those teams. So what's one of the key distinctions here of a service acquisition workshop as, a, as compared to say a normal catalog training course? Okay, so a catalog training course has developed courseware. That courseware is standard. It is a standard presentation flow. It has instructor support packages. An instructor uh, on a DAU faculty assignment uh, would theoretically then be able to pick up uh, the instructor support package and with uh, just a certain tempered amount of preparation be able to deliver that course. Well, a service acquisition workshop isn't quite designed that way. It actually has to be tailored for the team and for the event and the timing of the team in, in the overall acquisition process. Um, and uh, to the extent that that uh, preparation activity is, is done with rigor, uh, you're more likely to get a more mature uh, performance work statement and quality assurance surveillance plan out of the back end of a workshop. Once again, it's highly tailored and it's very highly dependent upon the actual multifunctional team bringing the folks to the table to help them uh, contribute in their own way. The next slide actually depicts the seven-step acquisition process. Across the top there, the seven steps are described, and I'm not going to go into each one in detail. Uh, however, each step has its own purpose in order to reduce the risk uh, to the program or the operation, uh, reducing the risk of either buying the wrong services, buying uh, services that don't conform, or not uh, fully assessing the risks of the services, and then also developing an acquisition strategy that goes along with it. Uh, in, a, in a textual free field format, you see below the plan development and execute blocks, the actual events or the actual products that would uh, come out of each one of the steps. Now, on the higher end of the scalable aspect of a workshop would be perhaps the two-year one that, that I was involved with, that a team would, uh, the very first workshop I was involved with, with them is they didn't have a team charter. Uh, their organization uh, does not have, or did not have, and it was a very new organization, Defense Health Agency, I believe, was chartered not more than a year before the actual conduct of the TRICARE recompete contract. And uh, those folks uh, had never worked together before. They didn't have the legacy organization that they had had prior to bringing together DHA uh, that had put together and formulated the requirements. So they formed what we call a pickup game. Uh, that's a basketball terminology or anybody out there on the playing, playing field know what I'm talking about here. And that is who's available, who has some subject matter expertise in this, and uh, let's bring them together. Well, a chartering document does several things to help reduce the risk to the program. First of all, it names somebody who's in charge. Second of all, it describes all the roles and responsibilities of the teammates. Third of all, it puts together a high-level plan of action and milestones for the program so they know which direction they're going to and when the outcomes are expected to be achieved. That reduces risk to the overall program such that we're, the team is not spinning its wheels trying to figure out who's supposed to be doing what. It's articulated in the chartering document. I actually spent three days working with the TRICARE team on that one just alone. Uh, subsequently, you would have other parts of the uh, seven steps that would be uh, facilitated with the acquisition team. Uh, at, at step two, we look at uh, ensuring that whatever, if this happens to be uh, an acquisition that is uh, brand new, that's one thing. But for the most part, all of the acquisitions that I've seen are either recompetitions uh, or, or they happen to be just follow-on efforts to something previously done uh, to support the overall mission objectives. And in that step, in step two, we would then start to gather the high-level objectives of the various stakeholders. 
we'd actually take and do a stakeholder analysis to ensure all the stakeholders are involved to the appropriate level and that they're consulted to ensure the requirements are being fully vetted and fully considered. Step three is the market research step. Step four is the risk analysis and the requirements road mapping process, and I'll go into that in a little bit more in detail as we use the demonstration for that purpose. Step five is uh, essentially the acquisition strategy phase. So now that we've defined our requirements, we've vetted them with our stakeholders, uh, we, we can now then take that and, and blend it together with uh, the uh, acquisition strategy, what the various contract types you would use, what the source selection approach you would use to do that. Um, so those are all, once again, uh, highly tailored, highly uh, facilitated uh, events that uh, the facilitator would work with the program leader or program manager if there happens to be one designated to do this. Um, what we try to do is, is try not to do what DOD has a tendency to do, and, and I know it very well because I've spent probably 30 years of my career in DOD, is that we tend to over-engineer things, and we tend to take what we use for something uh, like a weapon system for an aircraft or for a, a, a marine uh, maritime vehicle or ship, and we tend to apply that to nearly everything. And, and we don't need to really do that for a service acquisition. In many cases, a service acquisition is to uh, contract for advisory and assistance services. And for some of the things that you'll be looking at to do to implement your agency reform plans, you'll be wanting to consider the use of advisory and assistance services. And that's a particular type of service this described once again in part 37 of the FAR. So step six and step seven, I'm not going to go into any great detail. That's basically executing the strategy, actual conduct of the actual source selection event itself. And of course, step seven is what you want, right? Step seven is the performance, uh, the performance delivery on the part of the contractor and the performance management and performance assessment on the part of the government customer. So what we have here is uh, at the, the bottom bumper sticker of this slide, we actually uh, have a, a, a what we call the service acquisition mall. Uh, it's easy to find on any of your favorite browsers. Just search on the string service acquisition mall. It'll be the first hit you get. Uh, or you can just remember it by sam.dau.mil. Um, there we have all sorts of virtual learning assets, including videos, including a way to download the tool that I'm about to demonstrate. Um, and we also have uh, templates to use for your various products. I'm moving on to slide, next slide, slide six. Um, so this is a notional schedule, an example of a, a workshop that we have conducted at, at this level. This is what we would call a three and a half day workshop event. This is what we would, what we originally set up to do is kind of an out of the box type of you know, here's what it should look like and here's how you can get through the seven steps in that period of time. Uh, as you can see, uh, a good chunk of the three and a half days is, is set, up, set forth to do what? To, to do the most critical aspect of what it is that we're doing here, and that is to actually define what it is that we need, uh, TWS being a performance work statement development. So that, that's just a notional example. I probably have just sitting on my hard drive on my computer probably about eight or ten different variants of this, of the various workshops that I've been involved with. All right, so we've talked about what is a workshop. Let's talk a little bit about what, about, what the value is of the workshop. All right, so under the banner of Improved Tradecraft and Services Acquisition, which was a, a Deputy Secretary of Defense initiative uh, back in the days of uh, Dr. Ashton Carter, uh, we identified over and over again that we were not doing the requirements definition or step four step very well. And so we began to undertake uh, development of our tools, development of our business process, and, and development of a methodology of, most of all, 
uh, how do we improve the trade craft? What is it that goes into defining a requirement? Uh, what are the critical competencies and skills that are needed to make the dream come true there? Uh, what I would say is, is as much as anything else, uh, well, defining a requirement well is a matter, a combination of doing the critical thinking needed to determine what your requirement is, and then do the technical writing that puts that into written form. And why do we even need to put it in writing? Well, that that ultimately forms a business agreement between buyer and seller. Uh, it goes into development of the Section C Statement of Work, Performance Work Statement, whatever you want to call it, the requirement in a solicitation, which ultimately becomes a contract. So we're going to need to take all of that good thinking that goes in to developing our requirements, determining what it is that our needs are, and then to articulate them in writing. So effectively, the tools that I'm going to demonstrate in a minute here, these are technical writing tools and not much more than that. But the critical thinking that goes into helping the technical writing tool uh, provide you an outcome known as a performance work state or a quality assurance surveillance plan, critical thinking activity uh, is enhanced by the physical presence of the team, uh, clear definition of everyone's roles and responsibilities, uh, going through at the very early stages of a workshop and determining uh, what it is that would be the ground rules of this team and the actual ground rules of the team are articulated in the chartering documents. Um, so there's all a method to the madness of, of what I sometimes call making sausage which is what requirements definition is. It's not pretty, it's not easy, and it a lot of times will cause conflict. And, and that's where a trained facilitator comes in, is to be able to help the team get through those conflicts and to build a consensus on what that requirement is. So the ART-RD tool um, is downloadable on that site. I'll show you a couple links here in a second. Um, and it's focused on development of the performance objectives uh, the performance standards that the contractor is going to be working to, and the government's method of inspection for those services. Uh, services are distinct, of course, from products and commodities because it's, it's not uh, fungible. It's, it's not tangible item that you can actually measure the physical characteristics of, or you can measure the performance of a speed of, say, an aircraft or a tactical vehicle or some such thing. Um, so those things uh, require focus in such a way that uh, you articulate them in ways that are achievable and understandable by, by who? They're understandable by us, first of all, as a customer to ensure that we're what? We're accomplishing our mission because what is it that most of these services are being purchased for? They're being purchased to help us accomplish our mission. Okay, and then second of all, one of the aspects of using the, the tool is it provides a, a standard template for key documents. Uh, one of the aspects and characteristics, characteristics of the tool that uh, we baked into it was that the tool is configurable. If your particular agency has a particular format for a performance work statement or a quality assurance surveillance plan, uh, you can make the tool uh, work towards that goal by configuring it once you go into the configuration of the tool. Um, so we create a draft performance work state and quality assurance surveillance uh, plan and you know it's hard to edit it. It's hard to put tables in it. We can't do that using Microsoft Access. So what do we do when we want to get to the fine tuning of the coordination and the actual uh, review and stakeholder buy-in of the requirements documents. Many teams we found have at so, some point uh, chosen to use the feature of the tool and export that tool into a Microsoft Word document where you can actually do all of the uh, word processing functions of a more modern word processing application. Uh, once again, it's important to note that the, the actual use of the uh, acquisition Requirements Roadmap Tool Suite is a database downloadable file. Uh, it has been uh, screened and has been approved 
for use as a mobile code downloadable tool by um, the uh, Defense Information Services Agency uh, for DOD use. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the value and, and statistics of the number of downloads and users here on the next slide. All right, so a uh, couple things. So we have two complementary uh, courses or uh, training events that, that I'd just like to briefly talk about here to the workshops. Uh, one of them is called, uh, one of our catalog courses is called Ac Acquisition 265, called Mission Focused Services Acquisition Course. It's actually a three and a half day uh, classroom led course. Uh, the classroom led, led course is actually uh, a pick list, we'll call it, a pick list item for level three DOD certification under the Defense Acquisition Workforce Improvement Act. Uh, for two career fields, the contracting career field and the logistics career field. Why do we choose logistics? Well, we didn't choose logistics. Logistics chose themselves. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, lo logisticians of the world were out front and early in the area of what's called performance-based logistics. And they've got performance uh, aspects to supply chain management and logistics services that allow for those in types of measures to be put in as incentives or disincentives for contractors to achieve product support. And, and that's where I distinguish it here. Uh, that's for product support, but in this day and age, there's a, a bit of a blurry line, I'll say a very blurry line, between where does a product start and where does it stop and where do the services begin and end. Basically, it's a value chain. It's basically people, processes, and tools brought together to do what? To do your mission. Okay, so that's what we've done and we built a course around it. We've got 8,400 8, graduates uh, up to this point across the Department of Defense. Uh, and now what we see is we're ramping up towards about 300 uh, attendees or students to that catalog course a year. About 300 a year are actually not even acquisition workforce coded positions. Uh, so DOD is governed by the Defense Acquisition Workforce Improvement Act. The DAU is funded using that act and appropriated funds to do that, and we provide that catalog-based training to do that. Now the next item down in that top left-hand rectangle, CLC 013, Services Acquisition CLN, that's a continuous learning module. If you wanted to take that today as a civilian in across the federal civilian agencies, you can take that. In fact, uh, I can't recall the actual number off the top of my head, but of those 32,000 graduates, uh, I believe there are uh, probably, uh, I would say, uh, I don't know, 1,000, 800 to 1,000 uh, civilian non-DOD employees that have actually taken that course. And it's a three-hour continuous learning module that goes through the seven steps and introduces you to some of our learning assets that you can find online. All right, so for services acquisition workshops in the fiscal year ending uh, 30th September of 2016, we actually conducted 67 workshops, uh, workshop training events. That was a 31% increase from the prior year. Uh, Ten of those were uh, for acquisitions valued in excess of $1 billion, and the total value for all of those workshops, 67 combined, was a total value of $43 billion. Um, so needless to say, we have an impact on the, on the workforce. We have an impact on the mission. Uh, those training events are occurring uh, as we speak. Um, the next lower uh, pictorial the diagram there is the actual diagram of our service acquisition mall, where I mentioned uh, at sam.dau.mil, you can find uh, videos, knowledge, uh, the download of the art suite. Uh, up on the top right-hand corner is just a, just a pictorial of what I'm going to demonstrate to you in terms of the art tool uh, and its various components that go along with it. Uh, up to this point, we've had in excess of 14,990 registered users that have downloaded, registered to use and download the tool that have done so. 
Now, how many of those folks are actively using it? I don't know. I don't have an I don't have a program office. I'm not a program manager of that program. I was a core on the program. We had a contractor support that developed the tool. What we don't have is we don't have a user base for the tool. We don't have a known user base. It was created in the classroom and is now being used in the workplace in accordance with the terms of service as any software application would be used. They're not forced to use it if they don't want to. They can use it at their own risk as they choose to use it. And what's happening is we're finding that a, a fair amount of organizations are off in their own self-directed way using our tool set and our processes available on the service acquisition mall to improve their service acquisition trade craft on their very own and without any further involvement on DAU's part. Uh, we did conduct a user survey uh, back in 2000, uh, I guess it was, I think it was 14 or 15, and we asked the, uh, the, the um, survey respondents what, what, how they use the art, did, they help, did it help them save time, did it help them write a better performance work statement, and those pie charts just in a small way describe that there's uh, positive outcomes as a result of the tool. So we're award winning. We, through the Chief Learning Officer Award Program, uh, Mr. Woolsey, the President of Defense Acquisition University, was awarded the Innovation Award, the Silver Award for Innovation. Uh, and in the write up, it was described that the workshops have vastly improved employees' learning experience and saved taxpayer dollars by le making learning more cost efficient. So let's talk a little bit about the learning curve here, or the, the what I call it the forgetting curve, uh, which most of us, if we're, uh, mm -hmm. we've been to school any time in recent past or any training events, we know that about 20 minutes after we walk out of class the last day, the forgetting curve starts to take over. And it's a very, uh, I wouldn't say, it, it's a moderately uh, declining curve as time goes on to the point at which about three weeks later you've forgotten about 80% of anything you would have learned in that event. So what makes a workshop different? The workshop is what? It's a just-in-time training event delivered on request by the users, by the integrated multifunctional team around their requirement. So what did we used to call this in the industrial age? We used to call it on-the-job training, basically on-the-job training. We go to their job site. We actually send facilitators from our five uh, regionally located campuses throughout the continental United States. We send our facilitators into their facilities, and the multifunctional teams bring their requirements to do these. They do it when they need it when they want it, and they get to choose what their performance outcomes are for the workshop. I don't say, you must do the workshop under my terms. I'm DAU. I ask them what is going to best serve them and their needs at their moment of need. And that's where real learning occurs. Another way of describing it besides on-the-job training is experiential training, experiential learning. You're learning and experiencing the work at the same time. All right, I'm going to go into the demo now of the requirements definition tool. First couple of slides are going to show you exactly how to download it. This is the splash page, first page of the service acquisition mall. A button over on the right is called Acquisition Requirements Roadmap Tool Suite. You'll select that. Next page is presented to you. At that point, you'll have a choice. When you go through the text on the left, it'll say, would you like to download this? If you say, yes, I would, which would you like to download, the whole tool suite or one of the tools? If you select the whole tool suite, you'll get four database files in Microsoft Access format. You'll also get a Adobe Acrobat PDF file of the help guide for the tool. It's about a 70-page document. 
and it's very complete. And we also have with it built in within the tool help functions for use of the tool as well. Circle down on the lower right hand side of that screenshot is a place where you can click on art videos. In there are anywhere between two and a half and 15 minute videos that describe the process of using the art tool and can walk you through that. You can stop the video, you can download it, you can stop it at any point and follow along and keystroke your way through the learning process of how to use the tool. So now that I've already assumed that offline I downloaded and installed the tool on my hard drive because that's the primary place to use it, not on a shared drive, not on the intranet, and not on the internet. We didn't set it up that way for a reason. There have been many people that have asked us to make it a web-based tool, something like Amazon or some other shopping tools that you're, we're all very familiar with. Well, that's a whole different funding aspect that we don't have funding for, so we have not chosen not to do that. That would also potentially cause uh, difficulties with the data that's created into the database. The data that gets created into the database, many agencies consider to be source selection information. That source selection information could include cost estimates. It could include performance work statements. It could include evaluation factors for award. Well, two of those three items actually become part of the solicitation at some point in time, so guess where that goes? that's going to eventually go to the Fed Biz Ops and be solicited out on the market, or it's going to be solicited under the task order solicitation procedures under the h -Crafts contract or some other GWAC or GSA schedule that you use to buy that. So now back to the demonstration here. Once you have downloaded the tool, you open up the tool, you follow the help guide to help you ensure that you have the tool in the right place and it's ready to be used, you open up the tool and you say, hmm, oh, oh, there it is. Click here to begin. So you click there to begin. Next page presents you with the project list. We have built into the project here in the database file samples of previous projects that are what we would consider to be good samples for the various types of services there are. We don't have samples for all types of services. We don't chase down workshop attendees to get copies of their documents. Those are all things which are within the purview of the multifunctional team and if you actually go on to FedBizOps, you can actually find and make a determination. I can tell which of the solicitations on FedBizOps were actually de developed using our tool just by the way it's formatted. Ultimately, it gets converted over into a Microsoft Word document so that vendors can pull it down and use it in a word processing fashion, but I, I can tell that somebody has used the art tool to do that because it has some very distinct characteristics I'll talk about here in a minute. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I, now I've opened up samples um, and up on the second column in under the project samples, I'm going to select equipment related services. So I select that, open up the next slide, and in there is all the work, all the critical thinking, all the facilitation, all the performance standards, inspection methods, that's all been built into this particular sample. It's just that. It's a sample. It's not doing the work for the team that needed to have this done, but it's a sample to understand and to see which, one, which ones have actually been done and perhaps what is a best-in-class, well-written work statement. So what I'm going to do is walk you through how we derived and wrote out the task statement that's called C.3.1.2, Perform Profanative Maintenance Service and Schedule Maintenance for Government Furnished Equipment Vehicles. The task statement says the contractor shall perform pre preventive maintenance service and schedule maintenance service for GFE vehicles. So essentially here we're using a screen-by-screen -screen approach to write the requirement. 
down below at the near the bottom part, we talk about how to build your task statement. We broke building a task statement up into three parts. You don't have to use those three parts if you don't want. In fact, if you really wanted to, you don't even have to use this screen by screen approach. We actually built into the tool a capability to, if you have it in a discreetly formatted Microsoft Excel uh, document, you can actually import from a Microsoft Excel document all of these cells and with this structured data that goes into writing a technical document known as a, known as a performance work statement. So next, as we're going across the middle blue bar there, the one that says Statement ABC, Standards D, and Inspection EFGH, I now clicked on the standards button. So now that we've defined what the work statement is, when the work statement once again is the contractor shall perform perform preventive maintenance, we now have to set forth what the contractor's performance standards are for this. And to the extent practical, for many types of services, there are commercial standards for software development, for uh, maintenance type services. There's their ANSI, uh, standards, there's IEEE standards, there's all sorts of commercial standards that if we're buying a commercial-like service, we should be using the commercial standards and not creating something from nothing here. These standards should be in accordance with something that was created by some standards governing document or some governing body of some sort. So here what we did was we actually ensured that there, there's three types of standards, or actually two primary types of standards. There's quality types of standards and there's timeliness types of standards. So what does that first one says? It says meets all scheduled PMs. That's preventive maintenance schedules. So it meets all the scheduled ones. And then what is that? That's a timeliness standard. And then the next standard is it executes the preventive maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's preventive maintenance instructions. So for certain types of vehicles with certain types of engines, the engine manufacturer put together its performance maintenance standard of how often the oil needs to be changed, how often the belts need to be tightened, and all those things. And those are all contained in a separately maintained doc document by the commercial original equipment manufacturer. So that's where we would want to have that preference for it. So next we would have the uh, next block over from the previous slide would be, okay, how are we going to inspect that to ensure that the contractor actually performed the work in accordance with the standard? So the available standards are the ones we just saw a moment ago and what is it that the contractors, the government's going to actually do to determine that those requirements were met? So using the inspection wizard, we'll make that determination here in the next couple of screens. So the next question to answer there is question E with a closed parenthesis. What will you inspect to verify that the standard has been met for this task? So for preventive maintenance service, what is it that the contractor is going to do? They're actually going to have the wrench turner turn the wrenches, ensure the belts are tightened. We're not going to be there for what when they do that, are we? We're going to actually have records maintained for each vehicle by the prime contractor and the contractor is going to execute the actual physical work in accordance with the plan or the standards or the maintenance manual. And so those are the deliverables that we would expect to be asking for in the contract would be provide us with that maintenance plan and document in your vehicle service record that those maintenance actions were take, have, been, have taken place. So those are the kinds of things that go into determining the actual true performance requirements for a services acquisition. All right, so how are we going to inspect it? We have several different types of methods. We can do random inspection, we do periodic inspection, do 100% inspection. We can make a choice of that. And built into the tool is the 
opportunity to choose one of those methods. You can use previously determined on other projects types of inspection methods so that you don't have to think of this stuff out of thin air. You can actually have it baked into the tool itself and help you as you go along here. So how, how often are you going to do that inspection? The question right there in the middle, you have a pick uh, list right there. You can say continuously, monthly, quarterly, whatever. You have a choice there. But how do you come up with those choices other than to look in the tool and who helps you determine which choice to choose? The, the person that needs to help you choose the, the selection is actually typically a subject matter expert of some sort. And where do they come from? Well, hopefully either you have them as organic employees to your organization, or if you don't, you have, once again, what? Contractor assistance to actually help you do the quality assurance on another contractor's work. Uh, in in, in, in uh, weapon systems and information technology systems, we sometimes call that IV and V, in, independent validation and verification. Um, those are all things that can be done too, but somebody's actually doing what the inspection says and making the determination as to what that is. All right, so the next opportunity you have to have a performance-based acquisition is do you want to have incentives or remedies in the, in the contract such that you can have a 100% deduction for an out of compliance or uh, either an automatic deduction or do you want to just assess it once a year or at the end of the contract performance through the CPARS uh, report that ends up being required as part of the, the FAR? So that you have a choice there. So that basically concludes uh, the aspects of uh, what the definition of all the requirements would be for uh, perform pre preventive maintenance service and schedule maintenance service for GFE vehicles. As you can see there in the red outline box, you have all the inspection information. You have what, how, the frequency of inspection, who's going to do the inspection, any incentives or remedies that are part of that. So together with the aspects that you've already de defined, which is what is it that you're going to buy from the contractor under the contract, what it is that it's going to take for that to be in conformance with the requirements. Here's a summary report that includes all of that for what the same tasking that we had there before, C.3.1.2. So it has the statement, the task statement itself, the performance standards that the contractor should meet, whether it happens to be a quality or a timeliness standard. It has the inspection information that goes along with that, and then any deliverables. Next, what I'm going to do is over, I clicked on the top box that is the lighter blue called work products. So under the work products, we have, okay, what are all the things that are outputs from the work that you just did by defining your requirements? One of those is the performance work statement, requirement statements themselves. So here's what it looks like in draft, equipment-related services. Over in the red oval there, you say, okay, I want to go see what this looks like in a word processing document. Click on export PWS. There's a little Microsoft Word icon there. It says it's going to export it to Microsoft Word. This is the cover page that gets put into the document called Performance Work Statement for Equipment Related Services. It's a 20-page document. I'm just going to show you a very short part of it. This is the actual table of contents that gets generated. This is the standard template that's baked into the tool. The quality assurance surveillance plan and the surveillance matrix is, is another item that gets output from the work that you just did doing the defi definition of the requirements using the workshop approach. So what does that look like? This is basically the surveillance matrix that the the contracting officer's representative or the quality assurance specialist, the subject matter expert, this is where they go to determine what I'm supposed to be looking for. How do I know it's time to pay the 
contractor for the work. The contractor's going to send me an invoice. How do I know they earned their money that's on that invoice? This is how you do it. This is the actual surveillance that you do and that you actually perform as, part, as the role of a COR or the role of a uh, quality assurance evaluator. So, uh, to make this relevant to HCATS and what uh, you have an opportunity here to do to help you with your agency reform plans, I modeled uh, just briefly using three slides what this might look like for HCATS. I'm not going to go through all those uh, about 12 or 13 slides that you just saw. I'm just going to show you, summarize, and provide some feedback for it. So. We have an example here of an existing draft work statement. Uh, what I've done is I've circled in the blue box the essential meat and potatoes of what the contractor is going to be required to do. And it says the contractor shall provide technical personnel to support the office of the secretary in gathering information, analyzing, and so on and so forth. Okay, and over on the larger right-hand Blue, uh, blue box with white text, uh, those are my comments to that statement there. So essentially, this is advisory and assistance services that are being purchased here. Um, there are some exclusionary conditions that go along with uh, per the purchase of advisory and assistance services. So what we want to do is we want to ensure that the stakeholders and the subject matter experts uh, are consulted for a clear description of what those deliverables are that the contractor's going to contribute on or do as a completed product of their own. In many advisory and assistance services, and I, I've been involved in both the purchase of advisory and assistance services and in the delivery of them, um, what, what happens is you have a bit of a blurry line between the role of the government customer and the role of the contractor, ANAS, Advisory and Assistance Services Provider. Uh, they often work very closely side by side with each other. Uh, they uh, often may not have a uh, single person that's responsible for a end item deliverable. Uh, they may be responsible for con the conduct of research and the preparation of draft work product or draft materials. Uh, those folks uh, are basically being purchased for their subject matter expertise, and that's a good thing. We, uh, that's what we use ANS AS services for is subject matter expertise. The hard part about it is, as I say, it's hard time to sometimes distinguish that work which is done by a contractor and that you can then say, I've inspected it, accepted it, and it's good to go, and that work that the government person that sits next to them are collaborating on. Um, and for certain types of services in under the um, agency reform plans, you may want to buy some ANAS services. For others, you may want to buy uh, what might be called a turnkey uh, solution or turnkey product that says, I want the contractor to do all of this. I want the contractor to do, to do a full uh, research analysis report, write up recommendations, and put together an implementation plan, and that will be their deliverable to us. We would then take that uh, research findings, uh, recommendations, and implementation plan and turn that into an agency reform plan uh, that we would then turn over and, and submit to OMB as part of our deliverable for the agency reform plan. So, so those are all good things. And, and is there anything that, that can be done to improve upon this? Well, just, you know, um, some of the things to keep in mind when you do that is to, once again, uh, ensure that the, the, the delivery acceptance criteria is is carefully delineated in the work statement. Um, and you want to also ensure that there's a separation between uh, what that particular subject matter expert does as a contractor employee and uh, the work that gets performed by the uh, government employee next to them. And so as you see in the uh, green 
uh, circle or uh, rectangle and also in the associated green box to the right of that is that's what uh, paragraph 3.6 is set forth to do is that there's an actual program manager that leads the subject matter expert team uh, to do the kinds of advisory and assistance services that help the agency develop those agency reform plans. So that's just an example of the kind of things that uh, we would look at in terms of the critical thinking needed to ensure that their requirements are clear and concise and understood and something that enhances competition for the vendors that are going to be proposing on your particular requirement and solicitation. Okay, so what I then did was I took the HCAT scope of work uh, and I modeled it into the ART requirements definition tool. Uh, I modeled in those work streams and uh, so now you have what's called a work breakdown structure. That's the, the section three, the part C of the solicitation and or the awarded contract and the work statement. The, the basically the specifications of what we're requiring from the contractor. So I model that in there. And what, so what, where are we getting at here is, okay, so I, I then took that down to the next level, 3.2.1 is uh, the next level down of uh, work de decomposition. So once again, this is the critical thinking that it takes to, to do the job of, of the workshop to define a clear, concise uh, requirement such the contractor knows what they need to do to successfully perform the work. The government quality assurance or contracting officer representative knows to what to look for to ensure that the work is in accordance with the <laughs> services that we're expecting out of, the, the, the outcomes as delineated in the contract. And then, and just as importantly in my opinion, is how does the contractor price it? How do they know how to price it unless they know what's expected of them and what kind of standards they're going to do to perform against that? So this could be a HCAT's possible delivery, li deliverable over on the right at A. 002, a human resources strategy implementation plan. That's just an example that I came up with. Um, so what, it, what went into inspecting what that was? We inspect the services, of course, but we're going to do a review by who? We're going to do a review of the final plan by the contractor. Who's going to do it? The subject matter experts and or the contracting officer representative. And uh, we're going to do it in accordance with the performance standard, which is Okay, did the contractor identify trends in areas of improvement? Well, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Well, that's kind of the nature of the business of ANAS services. So the nature of the business of what we call at a higher level knowledge-based services. Subject matter expertise is kind of an eye of the beholder. And I often think of the terms that I learned early on as a lieutenant in the Air Force it's called bring me a rock drill. Well, how do I know it's good? Well, I don't know. That's not the rock I said. Well, okay, go back and bring me another rock. Well, sometimes that's the way it has to happen, and that's okay. Um, I'm not trying to pass judgment on that as an approach because knowledge-based services are often in the eye of the beholder, and how do we get quality built in in those cases? The way we built in quality in those cases is we build it in as we go along, just like we build in capability into software using software releases as we go along. Just think of this as a knowledge-based service. Okay. So those are just some examples that I, that I thought I'd go ahead and model here for you to, to bring home you know, what, what may occur for you all as you consider using HCATS for your uh, agency reform plan assistance uh, deliverables. Okay, at this point I'd like to turn it over to James uh, so he can uh, provide some summary comments with regards to HCATS. 
Thank you so much, Larry. I remember when I was a lieutenant in the Air Force, I had some of those same requests. Go find the right rock. Unlike our experience in the Air Force, OMB has been very specific on what they are asking of agencies. So we hope over the last hour and 20 minutes you have gained some insight in terms of what you believe your agencies need in order to fulfill the requirements of the OMB memo. We have provided for you two opportunities for you to utilize to meet those needs. We at OPM would be the point of contact, the POC, for you if you're interested in pursuing a SAW or pursuing HCAT's contract. We will work very closely with GSA, DAU, and OMB in meeting your needs. So on the preceding slide, the same slide that I used earlier in my presentation, you have contact information to let us know what your needs are. As you know, as I close, OMB has the deadline of tomorrow for the first submission, and then on September 30th, the next submission. We've heard through many of the agency leaders that they are waiting to get feedback from OMB before they decide whether or not to use industry partners. So what we want to do today was to let you know that we can accelerate the process in getting you with extraordinary talent to help you meet the requirements of the OMB memo. We look forward to continuing the dialogue with you should you choose to move forward. I turn it back to Larry to take you through some additional details about SAW. All right, so I'm going to continue uh, with a brief demonstration of the evaluation factor. So teams, when they go out and ask for industry to provide them with proposals, uh, have a choice to how are they going to choose the particular contractor that's going to help them do the work. Well, we created uh, another software tool, and another same kind of Microsoft Access downloadable tool called REF, or Evaluation Factors, that actually in the end produces a source selection plan, uh, and it uh, helps you to guide your way through the various approaches of doing a um, a best value trade-off or a best value low price technically acceptable type of a source selection approach. So this is uh, one of the four downloadable tools. It looks a lot like the Art RD tool, uh, at least on some of the screens. We're going to create a new project. Here, we're going to use the import function from the art requirements definition component, and we're going to import the project that we had just created for equipment-related services. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We've imported it. And now we have an opportunity to choose a best value source selection approach. We can choose best value trade-off, or we can choose best value low price technically acceptable. We're going to choose best value trade-off. And we have, over on the right, sample evaluation factors for award. They can be grouped in three general categories, cost price, technical, and past performance. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to choose from the list one of the technical approach uh, aspects for what we've done for the equipment-related services. So we're going to use the high-level objective approach. And of those two high-level objectives, we're going to choose management capability and management plan.
The next slide is the or next uh, screen is to indicate uh, what type of evaluation approach that we're going to use. We're going to use a critical skill set staffing plan. And for equipment related services, the, of course the critical skills for that would be folks that are familiar with the particular equipment that's being maintained, whether in a preventive mode or in a uh, uh, incident uh, created non-preventive type of maintenance situation. So from here, once we've selected that, we've made a few other choices with regards to our source selection approach and our evaluation factors using a pick list and using examples provided to us within the tool. We then want to go ahead and see what it is we've created here. Sorry, I skipped to the next slide accidentally. Okay, so we're going to select a we're going to select uh, the document that we're going to review, the source selection plan that was created as, as a result of developing the evaluation factors. The evaluation factors uh, then become part of the solicitation or section M, evaluation factors for award. Here's a template for a source selection plan that gets output from it. Once again, over on the uh, upper right, uh, about uh, ha ha the third of the way down, you see export to Word. You can export it to Microsoft Word and do further word processing editing from there on your source selection plan. So that concludes the, the prepared aspects of uh, the presentation that uh, we put together for your consideration. Uh, what we've done is we, we've demonstrated for you how to develop a performance-based acquisition solicitation and uh, any associated performance metrics, uh, performance standards that go into a contractor's work to ensure that we get what we pay for. Uh, the particular uh, tools that I've talked about today, the particular aspects of the service acquisition web mall website is available today. Uh, it's been in operation for several years now. Uh, we have some uh, some very what I would consider to be very uh, well documented, very well demonstrated usability statistics and user uh, uh, continued user uh, instances of uh, active community out there doing that. We don't in any way supervise that community uh, as to how they use the tools and how often. Uh, however, we have supported the tools in the classroom. Uh, we do have catalog classes that use these tools. Uh, Acquisition 265 is the one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, the things that we've talked about basically employ uh, enabling tools to help you do the critical thinking and to help the multifunctional team make sure that the requirements are set forth in such a way that they're clear, uh, they're concise, they're set up for contractors to be able to uh, review and then develop proposals in response to them and the associated cost estimates and pricing for that. Um, additionally, DAU has continued to focus on uh, continual uh, and continuous organizational performance improvement. Uh, we continually solicit feedback with regards to uh, our classroom uh, catalog courses as well as our consulting engagements, or what we call mission assistance, or in this case a service acquisition workshop. We continue to get uh, feedback from those and we continue uh, to get a, uh, an award-winning approach recognized throughout the Department of Defense. At this point, what we'd like to do is uh, go ahead and open up the Q and A uh, pod of the Microsoft or the uh, Adobe um, session for questions. Uh, to the extent that uh, we can review and uh, provide you responses to these real time, I'm happy to do that. And to the extent that uh, we may run out of time. 
uh, then we will take uh, action to, uh, on our best, best efforts to provide you with So the first one, uh, thank you for your questions up to this point. Uh, the first one I see uh, is from Janelle Johnson. The question says, can anyone recommend or share examples of statement of work for the HCOP? Uh, and I can't read the rest of the statement. Is there a way? Of We will check with our OPM colleagues to see if we can provide samples of the HCOP. We'll respond directly to you, Janelle. Same response. Thanks for your email address there, Janelle. Uh, Randolph Maurer of Department of Transportation said, will the PowerPoint be distributed to the attendees afterwards? Okay, so the PowerPoint is, uh, you can download it on the screen. We can also, if you put in your email address in the pod on the right-hand side, we'll be able to send it to you directly. Lawrence Williams' question is the same. Dana Anderson Does anyone hear this? <laughs> Thank you, Ken Muston. He has provided the answer for Janelle. If you're okay. not able to access it, Janelle, please let Ken Munson know. Ken.Munson at OPM.gov. Uh, and Monique Davis asked a question, does the facilitator assist the acquisition team using the ARC? Um, that's a great question, Monique. In both of our, both the catalog course, uh, Act 265, and in the service acquisition workshop, uh, I would say as a minimum, there's a day and a half of hands-on training uh, and facilitation and uh, assistance that, that whoever the, is attending, whether they're workshop attendees or catalog classroom uh, course attendees, those attendees actually get hands-on practice of creating work statements and, and the, re, the actual performance work statement document themselves. So th that facilitator assistance is provided under those conditions. So, Lawrence, if you provide your email address in the box, we'll, we will definitely send you the presentation. Um, from today. We're honored that you all have taken the time to spend an hour and 35 minutes with us. We appreciate your interest. And if you want to continue to dial all and avail yourselves of these services, please contact the POC at OPM. One other question is coming in. There is no ordering guide for HCATS. We operate under task order request. So we have a contract already in place, and as you develop your performance work statements or your statement of objectives, then that will lead to identifying the appropriate strategic partner to help you with your requirements. 
So unlike some other contract vehicles, there's not an ordering guide for HCAP. Ceiling is eleven billion dollars. That's for the H caps vehicle, small business and unrestricted. So we have lots of opportunities for you to avail yourselves of the contracts with strategic partners. We'll wait for about 30 seconds. Ken Munson, will you share what you mean by ordering guide for HCAPs on the website? The fee, two fees associated with HCAP. One fee, the contract access fee, which applies to both direct and assisted acquisition, is 2%. The fee for the assisted acquisition depends on the total value of the contract. can range from 3% to 12%. So the more you spend, the less it will cost. As I indicated earlier, the average price for assisted acquisition is about 5%. As you know, federal government is not in the business of making money. Those costs are to cover the expenses for both OPM and GSA. And you don't get charged twice, just one fee for the service jointly provided by both agencies. So I'll take uh, Monique Davis's question. Is, she asks, if I take uh, the course CLC013, can I apply the lessons learned in my agency without a SAW facilitator? Absolutely. You can do that. It's a three-hour course. You'll get a three-hour continuous learning uh, credit, points credit for your continuous learning uh, professional requirements. And uh, you don't need a SAW facilitator to apply any learning that you've done using either that or any of the other learning or videos available on the Service Acquisition Mall. Marcy, could you say more about the IFFC, unless Michelle Warren, are you familiar with the IFFC? So I'm not exactly sure what the IFF is, but the GSA fee is uh, incorporated into the overall fee charged with the OPM. Oh, the industrial fee. So yeah, it's all, uh, the fee itself is all associated for the assisted acquisitions portion. And then if there were industrial fees that needed to be captured because of the vendor being used, that would uh, have been in the rates on the schedule. Thank you, Michelle. So the industrial funding fee, if applicable, would have already been included in the fees I just discussed a few moments ago. No additional fees. No hidden fees. We'll be very transparent with you at the outset when we engage you in conversations about your performance work statement.
Johnson is on the OPM team. He was engaged at the development of the HCATS contract, so we appreciate his expert assistance today. I concur. He was more explicit. Uh, I rounded down. He went to the 500,000 mark. Thank you, Ken. We really appreciate if the remainder of you, we have 48 on the line now, would provide your email addresses. Thus far, we have 19. We understand if you think we're going to sell you something, but we promise we will not. The ball is in your court to determine what services you need from us. Those who are able to listen only and not provide any specific input or questions, feel free to send your email address to us at TMAP, Tom, Mike, Alpha, Alpha Papa at OPM.gov, TMAP at OPM.gov. We appreciate it very much. We're trying to track the number of agencies who have expressed interest in SAW or HCATS that will help us as we move forward in working with specific agencies who really have expressed an interest. So at some point, OMB is thinking about offering a complimentary SAW workshop. So those who have expressed the keen interest with specific requirements, you will be first in line. That's another reason we want to stay in touch with you. So if you're interested in a SAW, workshop may not be seven days, more like two days, we want to know of your interests and specifically what are you trying to accomplish with respect to the OMB memo and to what degree you have your agency's leadership approval to move forward. Then we would love to spend some time with Larry, OMB, GSA, and OPM and working with you in a workshop setting to develop your requirements. Um, I'd like to go ahead and answer Monique Davis's question as far as the uh, optimal number of team, multifunctional team members to participate in a facilitated workshop. Um, ultimately, the roles that, that are key to making sure that a workshop effectively achieves its desired and, and stated outcomes is it would include the contracting officer or cognizant contracting specialist, the requiring activity, whoever that requiring activity is. Sometimes it's the mission owner. Uh, in the case of human capital, that would probably be the chief of HR for that particular organization. Uh, it would also include some sort of program or project leader of some sort or another, that person uh, may come from any number of functional career fields. Uh, in DOD, they, they tend to come from that particular mission's functional career field, but sometimes they happen to be acquisition professionals. So that's more the rarity than the commonplace occurrence. So those three uh, uh, roles are really key to a successful one. 
but generally speaking, you're, you also need to bring several stakeholders that will have a say into articulating what those requirements are. In particular, I think in terms of the contracting officer representative and or members of the team that review, inspect, and accept co uh, contract deliverables, whoever they are. Sometimes they're subject matter experts that are part of the mission performing organization. So in terms of pure numbers, uh, it can vary. Uh, generally speaking, you need to have uh, somebody uh, that uh, really has a vested stake in, in achieving the outcomes, ensuring that the performance requirements are articulated, and uh, driving to a, a completion of the actual desired outcome. So whatever your outcomes are for your workshop, you get to de de design them for yourselves, and then we design who and the multifunctional team would be best invited to support those uh, outcomes of the workshop. I hope that answers your question, Moni. We thank everyone for joining us today in this interagency event to orient you to the services acquisition workshop that the DOD has utilized for a number of years as a proven innovative acquisition practice and introducing you once again to the human capital and training solutions contract vehicles, a best-in-class contract, both unrestricted and small business pools available for your use to help meet the reform plans and reorganizational efforts for a leaner and more accountable government. Thank you.